Welcome and thank you for tuning in to Real Talk, Real Deals, stories and tips from the real world of sales. This is a podcast where we're talking about how to be successful in selling. This is episode six and I'm your host, Andrea Grodnitsky. And today we're gonna be talking about emotional intelligence in selling. Our guest today is Becky Cassily. Becky is a highly sought after sales coach and a trusted advisor to some of the largest sales organizations around the world. Welcome, Becky. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks for having me. Yeah, happy to have you here. Uh, Becky, it's lovely to see your face. And, you know, I was thinking about the fact that I know pre-pandemic, uh, you used to travel quite a bit for work. Um, and it sounds like you've been maybe traveling a little bit more here and there. Where in the world are you today? I'm curious. Yeah, so the good news is I am home. You're home, good. As is evidenced by my post-pandemic life, I have zero time to decorate because I'm never here. So <laughs> I am thankful for that. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but hence, Pat, the clear palette. Yes, it looks clear it's palette. Yeah. Not, 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 well, do you, it's, I'm curious, do you miss um, or did you miss? It's not like you're back out on the road, but did you miss being on the road? Okay, so yes and no. Like doing the work we do virtually, that's a challenge, period, right? We're competing yeah. with so many things just to hold people's attention. It's so easy to just drift. So I missed that sort of level of focus and engagement and hard work. But I'm not going to lie. I like sleeping in my own bed. Yeah. I like having dinner with my family, you know? And so I will say that post-pandemic life has created that sort of sweet balance for me. Yeah, that's good. That's good. But you, but it does sound like you're, you're out on the road quite a bit. Yeah, and, yeah, definitely back to traveling, but better life balance than previous. So. Nice. Good, good. Well, I'm glad that we, you could fit us into your busy schedule. I thought I didn't know where you'd be calling in from, so uh, we're, oh, I'm glad you're home. So we are here, though, to talk about um, emotional intelligence and selling, and I'm so glad that you're our guest to talk about this. I've heard you talk about this topic quite a bit with a lot of different sales organizations, but you know, for anybody who's listening, simply put, when we're talking about emotional intelligence... In plain speak, it really is the ability to manage both your own emotions and understand the emotions of the people around you. So, you know, Becky, we'd love to hear your perspective here. Why is emotional intelligence important in selling? Yeah, you know, it's such a good question. And it's such a great topic to talk about. And I'm really excited to talk about this with you. So, you know, it's interesting. You ask, why is it so important in selling? It's really important to actually look at it from a buyer's perspective. Hmm. So we talk about the selling journey, but if we think about the buying journey and think about your own behavior, how many times have you found yourself at that intersection between logic and emotion when it comes to making a decision, right? I mean, there are so many decisions that I have made personally, and they have been emotional if I have to be totally honest, but I have backed myself into the logic afterwards, retrofitted it around yeah. my decision to justify it. And look, in business to business sales, logic plays an important role, but we're naive if we discount the fact that emotion is part of the buying journey. And so yeah, most, most people think they're logical though, don't they? I mean, I like to think that I only make, I know that's not true, but like we all like to think we make really logic-based decisions. Yeah, you know, that would be true, but the evidence of that would be that every single woman I know would use a plastic grocery bag for a purse. Because that is the most economic way to carry all these crap around, right? So true. That's so true. But there's a lot more that goes into my decision to buy a purse that yes. just doesn't carry my stuff, right? And so it, buying decisions are very complex and logic does play a big role in it. I don't want to say it's not important. Sure. It's not the only role. And I think as sellers, we have to recognize that. We are doing ourselves and our clients a huge disservice if we think logic is the only thing that we have to consider. Mm, yeah. And, you know, in talking with some people about this concept of emotional intelligence, particularly in selling, and, and I think you make a great point if you look at it from, from the buying perspective. Um, I mean, obviously, then salespeople have to tap into that as well. I'm curious about your perspective. Some people think, you know, you really can't teach it. You either have it or you don't, you know. I, I, what, what's, your, what's your perspective on that, Peggy? Yeah. You know, I do think it causes people to pause, right? We've all met that person or have them in our life, or maybe it's somebody's uncle, right? It's that feeling. But the reality is we teach emotional intelligence all the time, right? We call them the six critical skills. And mm. basically what we've done is we've taken what makes up emotional intelligence and we 
broken it down into these observable, repeatable behaviors that can be taught, practiced, and coached. Great. Well, and I mean, that's that's the key word that you mentioned here, right? Behavior, sort of the the how you show up in, in front of customers. You, you said six critical skills. Can you um, walk us through that a little bit? So, you know, there's so many things that go into effective communication. And to break it down to what are those components that really make a dialogue come to life? Uh, the six that we've identified are presence, relating, questioning, listening, positioning, and checking. And all six of those are what sellers really have to wrap their brain around what's the difference between good and great so that they can really make meaningful inroads in their relationships and the trust they build with their customers and in their ability to guide and shape their thinking. Is it, you said kind of this whole good and great thing, like, can you talk about, you know, is it a, you have it or you don't, or is there sort of degrees of excellence at, at those skills? Great question. So there's definitely degrees of excellence, right? You know, I think most salespeople that I work with, they know that they need to ask questions, right? They know that. They get sure. that. That's not rocket science to them. How good are they at it? Well, there's a huge factor. I mean, we've got folks who are really good at interrogating customers. Yeah. That doesn't end well often, right? But no. <laughs> somebody who is really good at recognizing that the job of questioning in a sales conversation isn't just to learn about needs to understand the client, but the job of it is to create conversation, to create an experience that is different and builds trust and helps you connect on a human level. Those are the people who are excellent at it. So yeah, there's lots of degrees of skill. So that sort of, you know, kind of begs the question then, you know, you, you must need to, if there's varying degrees, you get better through what, learning, practice, I mean, in your experience, how does somebody move, you know, from whatever the good to great is or increase their level of excellence? All right, well, Andrea, first step is admitting you have a problem, right? Not, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it sounds ridiculous, but it's true. We can't improve or change or become better at anything unless we admit that there's something we could do to be more effective. So self-reflection, I believe, is the key to emotional intelligence, right? Having the ability to pause and, and honestly assess, here's what I do well. And you know what? Here's where mm, maybe I'm not as great as I could be at that, right? Or here's where I struggle or I'm not as good at it. So, you know, I say in jest, but I'm really not kidding. Admitting you have a problem is the first step. Once you can identify, okay, here's the thing that I can do to be more effective, then identify, well, what are those behaviors like, you know, that good looks like? And what are my resources that I can go to? And who can I enlist for the cause? And, you know, is my manager someone who I can tap and say, hey, Andrea, you know what? I really think I can be more effective at questioning. So that's something I'm personally going to work on. I'd love to get you to observe me in my interactions and give me some objective feedback. What are your thoughts? I love that. I mean, I think so... We, we don't ask for enough coaching, I think, you know, in the business world. And I, you know, in my personal life, I think I look for feedback quite a bit. I like, you know, I know you're a, um, you're a tennis player, right? I mean, somebody to help you, you know, work on your tennis skills. I mean, there's a lot of parallels there, isn't there? Yeah, it is. And, and sadly, while I like to try to play tennis, I'm really only at that very low skill level where when somebody says, okay, what's your plan with your serve? My answer is to get it in. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's yeah. pretty much that's entry smart. level. Yeah. <laughs> so starting at basics. And then, of course, you know, I'm going to build on that with like degrees of excellence for sure. But, you know, at your point about, hey, we don't proactively seek out a lot of coaching. Right. And I just think that the reason for that is because through most of our careers, we probably haven't been coached. We've been criticized. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that I'm like, tough enough to ask for more criticism. Right. I'd yeah. love to be coached. I don't want to be criticized. And yeah. that, there's a difference between the two. Oh, 100%. Well, I know, you know, in your role, I was thinking about, you know, your role as a coach and you teaching these six critical skills that you talk about. Um, I'm just curious, you know, do you see a pattern like our, like across all different salespeople? Like, or, you know, when they're like doing self-reflection, is there one skill that like you see a lot of people just really are not great at? Yeah. And it's never the one. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Self-awareness. So, so it's funny. We always ask people to start developing a skill of self-reflection, right? Because we know your development is going to 
uh, have to be a journey and it's got to go beyond the boundaries of this workshop that we're doing. And so let's, let's work on what you need to be better at coaching yourself. Mm-hmm. And so when I ask that, I always see a similar pattern. I see everybody giving themselves high praise in presence and relating mm-hmm. um, and questioning their ability to position and check, which mm-hmm. I find so funny because at the end of the day, they all stink at listening. Like, Listening, yeah. <laughs> that was a really yeah. harsh word. I didn't mean it like that, but it, it's the funniest because it never meets the high or the low. Um, but always in the middle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, it's evidence because I always ask them to force rank and then somebody will raise their hand two times for two different skills saying that that was their best skill. I'm like, mm-hmm. you didn't listen. Yeah. You didn't follow directions. Okay. A different opinion than you about where your strength is. Right? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's not, I guess it's not a huge surprise, right? That listening is just a challenge in general, not just for salespeople, but for all of us, I would imagine. Yeah. So Sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you. No, 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 no. I mean, I would love for you to expand on it. I mean, what is it? And I know we'll kind of dig into each of these skills, but you know, what what is it about listening? I'm just, I'm curious about that one in particular. You know, there's so much that gets in our way, right? Like it, it's pretty funny. Oftentimes I'll open up a workshop and I'll have a ready to introduction. So I'll say, all right, listen, part of your introduction, I want you to tell me the first concert you ever went to. And so, you know, people will share it. And it's really funny because it depends on sort of the tenure of the sellers on what kind of answers I get, right? So it's yeah. like trip down memory lane or it's a bunch of recent artists I've never heard of. I'm like, right? Like it, uh, it, sometimes I feel dated when I do yeah. this. But the reason I bring this up is because later on, I'll say, okay, grab a piece of paper, write down everybody's name and tell me what their first concert was. No one can ever get them all, right? Yeah. Um, and we use it to really talk about, okay, what got in your way? And all the things that get in people's way from being able to do that are all the things that make listening so tough when we're talking to customers, right? So Look. I didn't suspend judgment. I figured nobody cared and I wasn't going to be tested on it later. So I wasn't really paying attention. Yep. I was reading my email. I actually wasn't even in the conversation. I was too busy trying to remember what I was going to say when it was my turn because I couldn't remember what my first concert was. So it was like <laughs> on and on and on. And, you know, one person was like, I'm sorry, I had something going at home. My babysitter was late, right? Like there's all of these things distract us from listening. Really? Um, and to be able to recognize what those distractions are, especially the one about judging the importance of information before we have enough context, right? We really? dismiss stuff the minute we hear it because we don't deem it as useful, but it could be the key to, to really winning over the hearts and minds of clients. So it's uh, so true. Yeah. Well, and you know, the, it really makes me think about how hard this actually is to do. If you really sit and think about each of these skills and what can get in the way or, you know, how being intentional about it can, can make you better um, and and being more self-aware. So actually on that line of thinking, I would love to Maybe let's start with those first two, right? Presence and relating. And we'll kind of focus there for a little bit, uh, which are, I guess, everybody feels like they're good at these skills, generally speaking. <laughs> they're not uh, right, so. Uh, yeah, let's start with the strengths. Well, let's start with presence. I mean, first, can you kind of define it for us? It might seem obvious, but I'd love to hear your definition. When we say presence, what are we talking about here? I love talking about presence, right? Um, you know, I think the simple way to define it is how you show up in front of your customer, right? Mm-hmm. But that's vague and, and that's not actionable. Uh, and so I actually would describe it as five things and they conveniently, they all start with the letter C. So it makes it easier. Yeah. It makes yeah, it easier yeah. to remember, right? So those five things, it is about your confidence, your mm-hmm. conviction, your credibility, your charisma, and how you can control a dial, right? All of those things really work together to, to create your presence and to show up well in front of a customer. Wow. I mean, those are like power words there. They really are. But how do you, I mean, let's talk about those a little bit. How do you do some of that? Yeah. So, you know, it's funny. I think when we think about presence and we think about how important it is and what we need to do, I think we all think, yes, presence matters. I've got to show up. In fact, um, there was some research that was done recently and it resulted in something called Swift Trust Theory. The interesting thing about Swift Trust Theory is what it was the number one thing that influences someone's willingness to trust you quickly is your presence, right? Hmm. Of all things, of all the things we bring to the table, the experience, the knowledge, the expertise, the technology, the solutions, you name it, it's your presence. Yeah. Right? And so when, when we think about it in terms of those five C's, right, what are those things that display confidence, right? So 
you know, like, let's talk about that, Andrea. When you think about somebody, you know, who's really confident, like what comes to mind? Yeah. I mean, they, good eye contact, I would say, uh, you know, they're sort of their posture. I don't know. They stand, you know, they stand tall and, uh, I don't know, open, you know what I mean? Like they're, they, they look comfortable in their own skin. That kind of jumps to mind when I hear, when I think of confidence. Yeah. It's exactly what I think of too, right? This idea of, oh, somebody who looks comfortable in their own skin. Okay. What do you keep somebody? Right. Like that sounds. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm great, but I was comfortable in my own skin. I wouldn't need therapy for 15 years. Right? <laughs> that doesn't seem that simple to do. So, you know, I like to think about it from the, the opposite side of the coin, right? So somebody who doesn't show presence, right? What do you notice about them when it comes to confidence? Yeah. I mean, definitely lack of eye contact comes to mind. Just sort of a, I don't want to say slouch. I don't know, but you know, that's sort of the the way they stand, uh, maybe even a quiet voice. I don't know if that qualifies, but sort of the way they speak, even throwing in some of those, you know, filler words all the time. It feels like a lot of very, um, just like the physicality, the attributes you can see in somebody. That's what really comes to mind when I think of, you know, the opposite of confidence, not seeing those things. Yeah, it's a, that's absolutely a great way to describe it. And so like, what does that mean for us? Well, it means being deliberate, your posture. It means being deliberate to look your client in the eye. And if you're virtual, to remember to look at your camera from time to time, right? Like, I like to look at faces. Faces are not at the same place that my camera is. It's hard to remember to do that, right? These are all small things. But, you know, sometimes we actually detract from our own confidence and our own presence just by small things like word choice, right? Listen to a seller the next time you hear them talking to a customer. And, and just note to yourself, how many times do you hear them say things like, you know, what we hope you'll find? Mm. Or what I think would be the best next step. Or we might be able to come up with some, right? Mm. Like all of those words, hope, think, you know, leave, you know, those infuse doubt into the dialogue and detract from your confidence. So I can have all the swagger in the world and great posture and good eye contact. But maybe the thing that I need to do to take my presence to the next level, right? I've got strong presence, but to be even more effective is to do something as simple as examining my word choice. Yeah. Am I detracting from my own credibility and my own confidence by using language that minimizes? Yeah, I love that. What about, um, I'm choosing one of your other C words here, um, charisma. How do you help coach somebody on improving their charisma? That feels hard. <laughs> the one's hard, right? Like, because yes. it feels personal, you know? Yeah. And that's the biggest thing that sales managers struggle with when they realize that they've got somebody who doesn't have sort of that natural or innate charisma that other people tend to um, really come by very easily. And so, you know, the question is, you know, how do we break down that charisma? So when you think about when you're naturally drawn to somebody, like, what are those things that make you say, oh, they're interesting to listen to? Mm -hmm. What are they, right? They're energy, right? It is interest in other people. It is the desire to understand my perspective. Those are the things that I view in other people that draw me to them. So really starting to think about, okay, if you find somebody who you enjoy listening to, or you think they're a good public speaker, right? How do you break down the behaviors that make you so fascinated by them? You know, and they're there. We've just got to figure out, okay, let's isolate what that is. And then let's replicate it and practice it and coach it and evaluate ourselves on it and give ourselves goal. Yeah, I love that. I know you touched on this just for a second, Becky, but like, you know, a lot of salespeople we know, some are back out in the field or back in the office, but they're still doing a lot of their work virtually as well. Many people are still selling over video, right? And um, I don't know about you. I, I mean, you can see that sometimes people might not work as hard or be as comfortable still to this day over video. And like, you know, it just seems like it's pretty important. I mean, your presence is really important over video, right? I mean, it's got to be. Yeah. I mean, it's almost more important, right? Because you lose so much more. I mean, there's a barrier. We're sitting in different planes of space here. There's something intimate about being in the same room as somebody. And you feel like you know them better, but this this is artificial to some degree. And so presence has even more significance when we're doing things virtually. And 
when we talk about presence virtually, it goes beyond like, okay, do I look professional? Am I examining my word choice? Am I showing good eye contact and body language? But you know what? It also goes into like, what's going on behind me, right? Yeah. Because this is now all, right? Whatever you see in this rectangle is part of my, my virtual presence. And so right now I'm maybe like I'm in a hostage video because there's not a lot going on behind me. <laughs> the perfect life here. Right? I guess it's like, good people can't see if they're not watching the video of this that you've yeah, got the walls true. behind you. <laughs> yeah, and just to be clear, there's nothing for me here yeah. in case anybody's wondering. But, um, you know, and it's funny because you had told like, right, still to this day, we're not thinking about it. And it makes me think about just recently, I had somebody who's in one of my workshops and I had about 12 people in that workshop and I'm looking at all the little images and I was I'm like getting closer and closer. And then finally, there's 30 something half drunk liquor bottles behind this woman. Right? That's so absurd. But then I'm thinking like, okay, I kind of think I'd like to be your friend. But yeah, you sound fun, but I don't yeah. know how professional that is. Yeah, I don't know what your clients are thinking if this is their first impression of you, right? Like you seem like a fun person, but yeah. So even thinking about, you know, now that I'm in a virtual situation, people are coming kind of into my home, into my home office. And, you know, are there things that are detracting from my credibility, from my ability to instill confidence in them to really show that I am professional and that they're in good hands? And yeah. like 30 half empty liquor bottles might be a sign, yeah, right? I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's sort of just, it's like, come on, you could, you know, you couldn't try a little bit more. I mean, I think there's this line that we've you know, crossed in a good way, maybe that our personal lives have come in to work a little bit more. You see somebody's dog jump up, it's fine. You know, we hear that, like, no, people aren't worried about that anymore, but that's not an excuse to, you know, show your literal thing of laundry behind you, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. in exactly. your space. Yeah. yeah. And so you're know, taking two minutes to like turn a video on and see what the view is from their yeah. perspective and think, okay, if I walked into this environment, what would my first impression be? Yeah. And and I think some people think, oh, it doesn't matter. It's what I have to say. And like, it's all part of, I mean, we are human beings, right? Looking at one another, particularly with like prospects or new customers, right? They are, they have to trust you. I mean, you you use that word trust and I think it's really important. And yes, what you say, what you bring to the table is super important, but it's the whole package. I like how you said it. Like, think of your presence as the entire screen. What's what's in that that rectangle? Yeah, I love that. Okay, I'd love to move on then to... um to relating. So that's that other skill, right? It feels like a, a, a close kin to presence. But um, I feel like when people think of relating, Becky, they think of the word rapport. Is that what we're talking about here? Uh, that's part of it. Yeah. But it's not all of it. Right? Mm -hmm. Rapport matters. We've got to be good at it. But, you know, is it good enough to be like, I don't know, hot enough for you? Right? Like if a yeah. person says that to me in yeah. my life, I'm really you know, that's what you say when you're stuck in an elevator awkwardly and there's, you know, an excessive number of floors. But that is not what you say to build a foundation of trust. It's got to be more than that. And, you know, whenever I ask, okay, what do I mean when I say somebody's good at relating? And I always hear things like, oh, they pick up on cues and clues in the office. And then they comment on that. Like, I see your son is, you know, playing football there, you know, and then they launch into these peaked in high school football stories that nobody actually cares about. Betty's Kitchen's completely on the cellar. The customer's just sitting there enduring this, you know, interchange and wondering, okay, what have you brought me that's meaningful and of value at this point? Because this isn't interesting for me. I think it just goes so beyond this notion of, you know, I build rapport by talking about something personal. So, you know, what else then? If rapport is just one part of relating, what are some of the other parts that you you talk to folks about? Look, you actually had a really good example of this. And I'm going to try to like get you to fill in the details. But you were talking about like, hey, you know, I've got this and colleague who she's really good. She's really good at remembering what. Hey, Andrea, I know you mentioned that you were going shopping last Saturday because you needed something for such and such a bit. Were you able to find it? And you don't even remember telling her. Right. Yeah. Like they were thinking of me or they were listening to me or they cared enough to ask me how that turned out. Right. And yeah. so it's that it's that ability to not just go through the motion of asking somebody questions, but being genuinely curious about them and, and caring about it and remembering, following up on it and showing 
you're not just a target to me. So I can go to my manager and say, I have this much of my pipeline. Yeah. I'm genuinely connected with you as a human. Yeah. We were talking about that colleague and um, she really is great at that. And it matters, you know, and I think where it matters is that she's able to very quickly build trust because people know that she's listening and genuinely like curious. I think if you are speaking with a prospect, yes, it's a little bit harder, right? You don't know anything about them, but I mean, come on, like you got LinkedIn and the internet, you, you could find something about their interests that's different than the weather to your point. If I hear somebody ask about the weather one more time, but I think when you have a customer or some, a prospect that you've spoken to two times, you should no longer be building rapport about the weather. I mean, you should have, you know, learned something I would think by that time. And it, you're, you said it, it's really the discipline of taking a note and caring enough to write that down and review it before your next call and talk to a person. I mean, it really does make a huge difference to people. Yeah. And you think about this whole idea, the challenges that we talked about with listening, right? Like I judge information before I know how meaningful or not meaningful it is. And quite frankly, if I deem it not meaningful too early, I'm not even going to store it in my short-term memory. So it's not even there to be recalled later. Yeah. And then I wonder why I can't make inroads with somebody. And that's because every time I meet them, I ask them the same rapport question and they roll their eyes and give me yeah. an obligatory answer. And then we're yeah. like, well, all right, let's talk about business. Yeah. People do business with people they know and trust. I mean, have you ever had to give your money to somebody you did not like? Yeah, it was torture. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. Uh, it didn't work out well. I will say that. It doesn't end well. Yeah, yeah. I will do painful things to myself to avoid actually having to do that. Right. Yeah. Like, I will suffer with the pain I'm living before I will hand over my hard earned money to somebody who I just don't like. And so, yeah, yeah, we've kind of really recognized that this idea of buying journey is logical and emotional. And, you know, if people don't like you, you're making it harder on yourself. And you know what people don't like? They don't like to be perceived as a sales target and not somebody with a genuine business issue that they need help solving. Yeah, that, I mean, that is, you know, such a big part of relating, right? It's not just about small talk. It's about that genuine curiosity in that person, sure, because we're selling to people, like you said, but also in what they're, what they're trying to achieve. That's a form of relating, of, you know, trying to walk in someone else's shoes. I think sometimes, I don't know, have you ever heard, like, has anybody ever said to you, Becky, like, do I have to build, rep I mean, like, does it really matter? I mean, don't customers just want to get down to business? I mean, what do you say when people, when people say things like that? If people say that all the time. And, you know, I'll say, all right, let's just play this out. Right? Like, I'll be the seller. Okay. You sit down across from me and, and I look at you and say, hey, Andrea, what is it you need from me? Yeah. How's that going to work for you? Yeah. Like, how are you feeling about me? Right? Yeah. Like, it, it just, it doesn't make sense. We don't go about our daily lives with that, you know? And the reality is we all have customers who are guarded, right? Who don't necessarily want to talk about the weather with their children, football, what they did over the weekend, where they're yeah. on vacation. And so what I think sellers need to recognize is sometimes the best way to relate to somebody it just to show respect and deference for the preference. Mm -hmm. but that means I had to pay attention to what those preferences are. Yeah. I my standard go-to rapport question that I'm going to open my conversation with, and then I'm yeah. going to pivot to business. I've got to weave that in, which is, listen, thank you so much for carving time out to talk to me. I know that you're busy yeah. and that it's really important to you that you walk out of this meeting with something of value. So I'm going to suggest we get into it right away. How do you feel? Oh, that, was, that was beautiful, Becky. <laughs> But I love what you're saying, though, because the, you know, you don't want to assume that somebody isn't interested in a little bit of rapport, but, you know, you have to take those cues and, you know, move it along and follow the customer. And but I mean, you know, people do want to interact with people and having a genuine interest and care really, really does matter. And it feels like that's a bit. But if you think relating is just about rapport on the weather, that's definitely you've walked away with the wrong message, I think. Yeah. I mean, I, well, we're going to wrap up soon because I know we've taken a lot of your time, Becky, but I do just want to ask, you You did tell one funny story. Any other like, I mean, you're out in the field all the time. Any other funny stories or like, you know, like big no-nos when it comes to presence and relating that you want to leave people with? There's so many, right? Like, I mean, honestly, we could talk about this all day long, right? Yeah. Like when I think about like all the things that I've seen that I've been like, huh, that's a, that one caused me to pause a little bit. 
Um, you know, and I think I can't think of any stories off the top of my head, but I will tell you that I had a woman say to me that when she talks to her client, she describes her product to them as, yeah, but this is the sexy prom queen. And I think, why? Mm, right. And so, like, think about that, right? Like, just using a descriptor like that is how you sell your product. What did I instantly do to my presence when I said, yeah, but well, we've got is the sexy prom queen. Oh, gosh. You know what? My 12-year-old would say cringe, I think. That's my reaction there. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. I mean, it's one of those things that, like, every single connotation is wrong. And what I've done is I have, I've displayed areas, which is distracted, you know, from my presence here. I have minimized everybody else by saying, but I'm the sexy prom queen. I am being sexist, quite frankly, right? Yeah, like yeah. I am diminishing, right? Like, and here she is. She thinks she's being witty and funny and charismatic. And so, you know, presence, it's such a thing. We think we're so good. Yeah. And yet there's so many ways to blow it. And, and, you know, having the discipline to really define for yourself, what does good look like that's consistent with me being authentic to who I am? Yeah. I love that. I love that. Yeah. I mean, it, it really, this, this concept of authenticity feels so important with presence and relating and a focus on more on the other, you know, okay. and, a, and a little less on yourself, which is tough to do. Okay. So, well, before we wrap up our conversation today, Becky, and you kind of started to do this already, but I love to net out for people at the end of our podcast, you know, we've covered a lot of ground. What are the, what are the top three things in your mind that you think sales professionals can do to really enhance their emotional intelligence and their selling efforts. Yeah. First of all, it's a journey. Let's make sure that we don't think that this is a destination that we're trying to arrive at, right? Um, you know, it's funny. I work with lots of really exceptional people day in and day out. It's amazing the amount of just really talented people that I'm exposed to. And one of the things that we always talk about is this notion of sales you've never arrived, right? Like just realize that. Because once you've arrived, where do you go from, it, right? Mm, like you, yeah. That's kind of where you go to die, right? Like, so in sales, you just have to think like, this is a journey. I'm never going to arrive. And the reality is I haven't met a seller who has converted 100% of your pipeline. I've never met someone who's done that. And so what that tells me is there's always things we could do to be even more effective, right? And so, you know, if we want to get better at our emotional intelligence, I think, you know, number one, recognize that can be, right? Especially if you're in a sales leadership position, don't just think, okay, well, I can't help my team, right? Yeah. Right, because right? you can. You yeah. know, those absolutely observable behaviors that you can isolate, that you can describe, that you can practice, that you can repeat, that you can be coached on. I would say that's probably one. Right? Yeah. Um, number two, I would say be more deliberate about your presence. I think we all know, like, okay, I gotta, I gotta brush my hair and, you know, brush my teeth, maybe put them with on, right? But it's so much more than that. And so, you know, practice, right? Do dress rehearsals. Think about how you're going to show up, what you're going to say, what your word choice is indicating about you, about your confidence, about your credibility, really thinking it through in a much more disciplined and deliberate way. And then the third thing is that recognizing that while rapport is an important part of relating, it is just that. It's just part. It, it goes beyond rapport building. And it, it's not something that you pay attention to for the first minute of a conversation. And then you don't have to worry about it. You have to relate throughout the relationship by demonstrating it listened. You know, it, using their word back to your customers, right? These are the things that are meaningful, that show, I heard you, I care about you. Love it. Becky, awesome. Thank you so much. Great, great three tips to take away. And I'm so appreciative of you joining us today and sharing your insights. I know our listeners will certainly find them helpful. Now, if you'd like to connect with Becky or to reach out to her with any questions, you can find her, of course, on LinkedIn at Rebecca, not Becky, Rebecca Cassily. That's two S's, two L's. Uh, and again, thanks to all of our listeners for tuning in today. And for more sales tips and best practices, you can check out Richardson Sales Performance on LinkedIn. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Andrew.